Howdy, everyone, and welcome to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Sarab Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And we have another fantastic episode for you guys today. We really loved the feedback that we got on the episode we did with Ryan Anderson out on his wonderful farm in rural Virginia. Uh, we want to do more fun stuff like that. So if you have any ideas, please feel free to email us at podcast at americanmoment.org. Uh, Nick is shaking his head because he's upset that I'm consigning him to more emails. But they you know all what? go to me. I understand. <laughs> And that's great. So you should definitely do that. Um, but today we have on someone who's been a huge influence, not only on myself and Nick, but on the entire American right. And that is Sora Bamari. But before we get to that, uh, we wanted to answer some questions that we got from five-star reviewers. Once again, if you'd like your question answered on Moment of Truth, feel free to subscribe to the podcast, rate us five stars, and then in your review, ask your question or send us a screenshot of the five-star review that you gave and email that to podcast at americanmoment.org. Today, we have a question from Rachel. She asks, what tools do Americans have to push back on CRT, critical race theory, in our institutions, business, education, et cetera? Does that necessarily have to come from politics or can Americans do more to prevent CRT's cultural creep into our daily lives? I think it's a fantastic question. Um, Look, with the show focused on politics and policy, we never want to elide the importance of that in these important cultural questions. In fact, we think it's, it's often cope to pretend like the answers to these are purely cultural. But I will say beyond the politics and policy aspect of it, um, you know, a friend of the podcast, Andrew Kloster, has a, a Substack piece he wrote not too long ago called, I think, uh, Rules for Radical Patriots. And in it, uh, I'm going to botch it slightly. He has a he has one of his rules is, you know, I, I will speak up when I see injustice around me. Uh, the one thing that our present moment lacks the most is people with courage. We lack leaders with courage. We lack elites with courage. We lack politicians with courage. We lack corporate leaders with courage. We lack people of courage in positions of influence across American life. And so in and of yourself, where it is sane and 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 responsible to do so, don't you know ruin your family's ability to earn a livelihood. But if you have any position of influence or authority in your life, I think it's your moral responsibility to speak out with courage and forcefulness when you see this, this banal racial essentialism dominating institutions around you. You have to speak up because if you don't, who else will? And why can you expect your elected leaders to speak up when they don't see their voters exhibiting the courage themselves? What do you think, Nick? Yeah. So you said most of the things that I was thinking. Uh, I will say that I think the first place to start when it comes from politics is to refuse to fund or support uh, in any material or uh, political way, things uh, which seek to destroy you uh, and and the people in your community. Meaning that if local schools or community colleges or even state colleges want to push this radical, critical race theory ideology, uh, we should refuse to fund them. We should refuse to give them tax breaks. We should refuse to give them any material support uh, in any way. Including your own children's tuition dollars, presumably. I'm sure, 100%. Yeah. Um, and then I think in your personal life, bringing it back home, you have a duty to speak truth. Um, you have a duty to speak truth in all things, by the way, not just uh, not just when it comes to cr critical race theory, but into all radical and, and outlandish theories that seek to undermine uh, our culture and values. You have a duty to speak truth. Um, and the lie of critical race theory that we all have this innate racism or this innate sin that you can't get rid of, that you can't be absolved of, uh, is an evil lie. It is, it is not true, uh, and should be called out whenever possible. Um, I think those are the two solutions to answer your question very simply refuse to support any kind of ideology like this and call it out and speak truth when you see it. And that being said, also insist that your elected leaders uh, hold truth um, uh, as paramount and and 
fearlessly destroy the institutions in American life that are advancing this fundamentally un-American, unhuman, and unjust worldview. Uh, once again, if you'd like to have a question like that answer and have Nick and I rant our heads off and turn blue in the face, uh, rate us five stars, ask a question in your review, or take a screenshot of your rating of five stars and, uh, and send it in on, uh, on our podcast at American Moment email. We do have another question from Gabriella. I know you're itching to move on, but I but this is a really good question. I I really think we should answer it. Um, she says on the new right, especially among Zoomer cons for the boomers that watch, that's people in Generation Z uh, who are also conservatives. Uh, there's a habit of glorifying working class existence without understanding its harsh realities, hard physical labor, long hours sacrifice and distrust of institutions that repeatedly fail them how does the new right avoid fetishizing the working class this is a really good question yeah uh, props to you gabriella um i think that it is important to value um manual labor i've talked about it before you know i used to work uh in a pig barn shoveling pig excrement. I tell a lot of people with some of the most, uh, you know, fulfilling years of my life, though I've I've done a lot since. Um, I think it's important to, to hold that in one hand while in the other uh, looking at your own personal circumstances. Um, I think it's important to not make yourself into something that you're not. Uh, just because the new right is 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 kind of focused on bringing politics back to this, um, you know, trying to win blue collar votes essentially uh, does not mean that you need to uh, renounce your job in finance or in law or renounce your college degree uh, and go and work on a farm. I think we're all called to do what we can wherever we are. Uh, you, listener, watcher, uh, oops, are uh, called to influence the the workplace and community that you're a part of. Uh, so whether that's in the finance world, whether that's in law, whether that's as a professor, as a student, or as a laborer, um, you're called to do things and have influence where you are. And, and so my advice would be, don't pretend to be something you're not. Use your strengths uh, for the common good. What we're trying to do at American Moment is rebalance the scales away from a failed worldview that dominated the American right over the last 40 to 50 years. One that said that knowledge work is the the apotheosis, the ultimate form of your self-fulfillment as a Westerner, as a person in a developed society in a, in a quote unquote decent civilization. We fundamentally disagree. A just economy has a, a bell curve, if you will, of different sorts of work that you can do to, uh, you know, in a dignified manner, provide for your family and and earn a decent living. That includes blue collar work. It includes everything from farmers and electricians all the way to bankers and lawyers. It is properly understood diverse as any civilization that's capable of maintaining itself in its own ecosystem is. The reason that we put such a premium on the working class at American Moment is because the right has so singularly focused on the bankers and the lawyers to the detriment of the electricians and the farmers over the last mm. 60 years. But it doesn't mean that everyone needs to be an electrician and a farmer. In fact, we are singularly motivated with getting people of good character and solid alignment and a dedication to come work in politics, which is fundamentally knowledge work. In fact, it's probably the most knowledgey work of all. Um, don't make uh, a, a idol out of one particular way of living. There is a reason that people consider uh, graduating to knowledge work after successive generations of hard labor is something to be strived towards. It's hard. Most of you listening to this podcast could not survive if you were sent to go actually do an honest days of hard labor. But it means that you should treat the people who do with dignity, with respect, and with kindness and understand that their material circumstances, their long-term success 
is equally the responsibility of a responsible right, as is the success of knowledge workers. Yeah, you hear that, Gabriella? Don't do physical labor because you can't handle it. <laughs> That's Rob's message. No, for you. no, no. Uh, I know for a fact who this person is, and and they actually come from a genuinely working class background. <laughs> um, but once again, if you'd like to ask questions like that and have us rant, because we clearly are itching to tell uh, what we believe about things, not just uh, mm -hmm. interrogate our guests on on moment of truth, uh, you can. Uh, rate us five stars and include a question in the review or you can email us at podcast at americanmoment.org with your five-star review and we'll try to answer your question on our podcast but without further ado we'd like to get to our guest for today uh, this guest is someone we wanted to have since the very beginning he's someone who's been extraordinarily influential on myself on nick and on american moment as a whole really on the American right as a whole. Today, we have on Saurabh Amari. He is the op-ed editor of the New York Post, a columnist for First Things, and a contributing editor of the Catholic Herald. Previously, he served as a columnist and editor with the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages in New York and London, and as a senior writer at Commentary Magazine. In addition to those publications, he, his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Times Literary Supplement, the Chronicle of Higher Education, The Spectator, Dissident, and America. His latest book, which is what we primarily talk about today, is The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos. It's a fantastic book. Uh, I'll be entirely candid with you guys. I don't read that much. I don't have time. And uh, the liberal order has rendered such a profound ADHD upon me that I often have time focusing enough to do so. But I will say, upon reading this book, which I had the privilege of getting an advanced copy of, um, I was glued to it. Uh, it is invaluable. I will recommend before you even listen to this podcast that you go buy it. It's incredibly important to support the work of people like Saurabh who are speaking out in an environment where it is very difficult to do so for the time-tested truths of civilization. Um, I think we had a fantastic episode with him where we discussed a whole variety of topics. Nick, what do you think? of? I I, I have to say that you did say during this episode that the book was so good that you read one section and it made you so angry you had to like pull over on the side of the road and just contemplate angrily in silence. Yeah. So if that's not an endorsement for this book, yeah. I don't know what is. Yeah. You should buy it. And without further ado, we'll go now to Sora Bamari. Saurabh, thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Saurabh. And <laughs> <laughs> that's never going to get old. Um, nope. It's 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 one of the greatest things. It's like you know, it just so happens that two people with slightly different spellings, basically pronounced the same, ended up in a very similar segment of American politics. Yeah, it is almost some providential design in it. I, hope. I I think so. I think I even if I didn't share your politics, I would have eventually ended up there just out of you know convenience or something, or maybe I would have ended up polarized against right. You know, that it's like, Sorab, <laughs> don't confuse me with that Sora. Yeah, yeah, that He's perfidious an abomination. Yeah, yeah. Sorab Sorab v. Sorab. Yeah, yeah. Or if you hadn't had your conversion, you know, it would have been the perfidious neocon Sorab versus, you know, the, <laughs> the other one. Um, uh, speaking of which, uh, the first thing we always like to do with our guests on the podcast when they come on is is try to trail their journey to getting to the point where they are now. How did you end up uh, doing all the various things and having the profile you have today? Walk us through the journey. Uh, sure. So I... After college, I did something called Teach for America for two years. Then I taught at a um, charter school for an additional two years. Went to law school, um, intending to become a lawyer. And um, uh, in fact, I did a, like a summer associateship at a large firm. But all along, I was writing. I was beginning to, to write uh, for a public while I was a law student beginning with writing about Iran and the Middle East, just because that's a way to get my foot in the door because it's something you know about. Otherwise, why would you publish op-eds by a 21-year-old, you know, or 23-year-old law student? So um, I did that. And then there came a, a point, like the summer where I would have studied for the bar to go to the firm uh, or to join the Wall Street Journal editorial page as what they call um, uh, the Bartley Fellows, which makes it sound like really awesome, yeah. but it's just an internship. And so, yeah. uh, or to go to, to a large firm and then become, you know, a, an associate. And I picked the uh, 
the latter route, uh, I joined the Wall Street Journal opinion page as a, as a book review, as a junior book review editor uh, at the end of that summer. Then they transferred me to London as an editorial writer and to edit, uh, to help edit the opinion pages for the European edition of the Wall Street Journal. Did that for four years. And then um, I joined Commentary Magazine for a year just because basically the salary offer was hard to refuse. <laughs> and then... Uh, did that for a year, and then opening up uh, opened up at the New York Post to to be the op editor, and I I jumped on it just because I wanted to. First of all, I didn't want to write every day. I have enough uh, enough things to say that could stretch uh, over various pieces, but I didn't want to have to write in that blogger style every day. That was becoming tiresome, and I wanted to just edit and preside over my own little corner of the uh, conservative world. Yeah, and so I did, I did that. That was two years ago, I guess. So. Yeah, or and three years ago. Sorry. Yeah. In parallel with that, uh, you know, professional journey, uh, I think there was an ideological and an intellectual and a personal journey as well. Uh, why don't you walk us through that? What what got you interested in politics to begin with, such that you would have made the choice to go to the Wall Street Journal as opposed to to the big firm, where I'm sure the the paycheck was quite larger. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and it would have meant that I wouldn't still be saddled with law school. Uh, Loans. Yeah. Um, Don't go to law school, kids. <laughs> it, let me look at the camera for that uh, portion. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wanted to. Why did I go into politics? Because, uh, you know, I was a young liberal internationalist by that point, or a kind of neoconservative, where I, th I felt that um, American order is uh, worth spreading to the world. Um, including by force of arms. So I really was a kind of committed neoconservative. And um, uh, and that meshed with the fact that I, I did really know something about Iran having lived there for the first 14 years of my life. Um, so that's how I, yeah, that's why I did it initially. What was sort of the, the first cause of, of your apostasy from neoconservatism? What, what, what sort of precipitated it? What, what was sort of the, the first, you know, Jenga block to use an analogy that, that fell that made you sort of open your eyes? It was not long after I joined the Wall Street Journal. Then, in fact, the Arab Spring happened right as I joined the journal. And um, I mean, my, to be fair to uh, my editor at the journal, Brett Stevens, you know, he wasn't... Um, blindly enthusiastic about uh, the Arab Spring. Nevertheless, I mean, those were the ideas where that had percolated in that sphere of the of that um, it's worthwhile to see these autocratic Arab, Arab regimes fall and and to hope for young secular Democrats to take over. Um, it's just complete a fantasy, a, a fantasy of what the Middle East is really like. And so I, I watched with horror the outcome of the Arab Spring, the fact that the Muslim Brotherhood soon took over in Egypt. That was, I think, that was one of my first kind of uh, red pills, if you will. Um, <laughs> and then I did this integration of Libya, um, the irresponsibility of the Libyan decision, having supported it. Um, the and then the outcome of Syria, the the massacres against Christians. All of these were become, and I was voicing it like mostly privately, but uh, uh, in some cases publicly. And then a major one came with the. 2015 2016 migrant crisis um your the european migrant crisis because i was based in london at the time and brett again my boss was like go report on this because as he put it um whoever can combine something of our free borders open borders worldview with like basically like sympathetic uh, colorful reporting about the suffering of the migrants will get a Pulitzer. So jump on that. So and I and I got on the next plane to to Turkey and to Greece and I followed a lot of the migrants. And but because I speak Persian, I, I noticed that a lot of the migrants were saying they were Afghans and I knew they were Iranians. They were telling me they were Iranians. And so that was, you know, that they're not es escaping warlordism. Conditions in Iran are really bad. And I migrated too, although legally, I, I mean, I, but but the point is that it wasn't as they as it was painted in the media. Or you'd hear like people would say, uh, I, I would read these Guardian stories that were would say, um, you know, Ahmed, an engineer, and and everyone you ask was an engineer, and I would thought if if Syria had this many engineers, it would be like Switzerland, like what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. I was like, again, it was it, just this kind of elite mythology, and when I say elite, I don't mean the left or liberals, but also, I mean, also the kind of, yeah. you know, the WSJ mythology. And I thought, okay, no, this is, this is, um, 
uh, this is out of sync with reality. And that was a real, uh, and the question of, um, you know, can Europe integrate a million newcomers? How do you vet which of them have are really terrorists? They all threw away their passports as they coming in and to say, like, I'm just I just ran away with nothing. I don't have any identity papers. How were they vetting them? Um, how, what would that what would that mean for social cohesion? Uh, if I were Europe, a European, whether I'm living in the Balkan states that are like sort of the initial receiving point for these migrants or I'm further out in the destination countries like Sweden or Germany. Yeah, I would be I would be alarmed. Like, you know, who are we letting in? Is, 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 do I have any right over my borders? So. Those, so the Arab Spring, the outcome of the Arab Spring, and then the 2015, 2016 European refugee crisis were my first. That didn't make me become who I am today ideologically, which is much more complex and it has a faith dimension to it. But my departure point from neoconservatism. So spending, you know, you mentioned spending 14 years in Iran. I think everyone at this table has spent... Uh, a considerable amount of time in Iran. Uh, uh, well, not in Iran. I just meant uh, abroad in general. Yeah. You know, myself in Honduras. Rob... I've, I've spent the least, interestingly enough. I yeah, spent about uh, four years abroad. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I know that for me, uh, you know, my time in Honduras uh, still plays a lot into the way that I think about policy, politics, um, even you know, my philosophy uh, to a certain extent. Um, how does your experience in Iran? still tinge your politics uh, today? And and how did that perception change from when you were neoconservative to now? It's a really good question and it's a difficult question because at the end of the day, when you're 13, 14 years old and you're interested in, I don't know, G.I. Joe and, and Transformers, you don't yeah. really have that kind of depth of perspective to think about, okay, how is it shaping me? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really struggle to answer that question. I mean, um, in the, on the one hand, um, I certainly have written about the fact that uh, the Iranian regime, because it was a revolutionary regime that claimed the mantle of tradition, for a long time turned me off of all tradition, all faith. All faith must be this kind of barbarism of mm. the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so it took a long time for me to realize that, you know, no, there's there's reasonable faith and unreasonable faith. Um, and um, uh, there's reasonable tradition, unreasonable tradition. So th in a way, I guess th to answer um, in one sentence that the, the way it defined me was mostly in a way in the negative that I, I, I don't want this, I seek the West, and my idea of the West sitting in Iran at the time was, as, as much as a 13-year-old could comprehend these things, a, a decadent secularity. And I wanted that. I wanted that kind of, everyone gets to define themselves. Uh, uh, religion doesn't have a major role in public life, unlike the way it does here. And that's a good thing. And that's all I want. It's a kind of simplistic worldview. A lot of Iranian liberals that you encounter in, in Washington still have that worldview. Um, where they, the experience of the Islamic Republic has conditioned them to think that all faith is, is a source of repression, and and um, the sooner it's done away with, the better. Yeah, I think a lot of us can identify with that. Um, particularly, it's it's almost like a, a story arc that happens frequently in in books, movies. Like you want X thing, and you work so hard to to get it and to get there and get the thing that you want. And then you realize it's not it's not all it's cracked up to be. You know, it's not it's not what you thought. And I think a lot of people experience that with, uh, you know, the individualism of the West. You think, you know, being responsible for your own decisions and not having, you know, superiors or whatever that can that can intervene uh, is a good thing. But I think I've realized, you know, certainly into adulthood and moving out to Washington, D.C., away from home. Uh, I think I realized too that it's not all it's cracked up to be, and sometimes you miss the tradition of of family and community, which is a a very very good dovetail uh, to your book, which is out now and is fantastic. I want to read a passage from it because I think it it sets the stage very well for the impetus you had for writing it. Uh, 
Max's very existence, you're referring to your son here, is a product of the autonomy maximizing barrier dissolving impulse that animates modern America. Only in America, as they say, could an Iranian born journalist meet and marry a Chinese born architect, a union that would eventually produce a child given the delightfully Habsburgian name Maximilian. But no amount of gratitude can allay the anxiety that grips me when I ask myself, what kind of a man will contemporary Western culture chisel out of my son? Which substantive ideals should I pass on to him against the overwhelming cynicism of our age? What worries you about the son that you're going to raise? So this Max is named after St. Maximilian Kolbe. St. Maximilian Kolbe was a Polish Franciscan friar, um, lived a remarkable life in the years leading up to World War II. He went on missions to Asia. He started newspapers, uh, evangelizing his own culture. Um, but his claim to fame really is lies in his um, his death because the round, the Nazis rounded him up in 1941. He had been broadcasting anti-Nazi material from his amateur radio station, publishing anti-Nazi material uh, in his newspapers and so forth. So they rounded him up, sent him to Auschwitz. And then in 19, July 1941, um, a, a prisoner escapes from Kolbe's prison block and he... Um, is not one of the 10 chosen to die randomly as punishment for the for the one escapee. That was the Nazis' practice. If someone escaped from a prison block, 10 men would, would be picked randomly. Um, St. Maximilian Kolbe is passed over and is not condemned. But when he hears one of the condemned men cry out, my wife, my children, he steps forward from the line and the camp deputy commandant, Karl Fritsch, comes by and says, what does this Polish pig want? And St. Maximilian Kolbe says, uh, Kolbe says, I'm a, I'm a Catholic priest from Poland. I would like to take his place. And he does. So he dies in that starvation chamber. So that's the Maximilian who is my son's namesake. And my fear is that our contemporary account of freedom, of what it means to be fully human, which we don't even have a proper account of it anymore, um, will make the sacrifice of a Kolbe insensible to my son. Like, why would you do that? If the point of life is to just maximize your choices and maximize your autonomy, then the decision to lay down your life for a stranger at Auschwitz doesn't doesn't make sense. And so the book is my attempt to, in a way to try to tether my son to the traditional religious and spiritual and moral foundations that made possible this remarkable act of self-sacrifice. So I have a passage soon after that where I sort of imagine my own son grown up. And it's not like, I mean, his my, his mom and dad are part of the American kind of upper middle class elite. So chances are we will, uh, he, he'll inherit that status. That's not the fear. My fear is that he'll come back from college. He's about to get a job at a hedge fund or an advertising agency or a publishing house, whatever it may be. And he'll just be sort of, self-serving and just self-interested as our elites are with no sense of who am I serving or who, um, what inherited obligations should I accept? Everything is about what choices he would make, uh, in, in gratifying himself. That's kind of my nightmare for my son. Um, and it's an odd one, I guess, for some, if you think about it, if you, um, if your son is, gone to an elite college and is, is is kind of have gainful employment, you should be happy. But for me, I guess that's not enough. And so the book is an answer to that anxiety. You know, what, what, one criticism might be that, well, is that an indictment of your confidence in you and your wife's ability to parent him? But, but it's your contention that it takes much more than just the environment in a household to raise a, a noble and just next generation of people. What are the other components that you need in a functioning society in order to to ensure that that children grow up with that mindset? Yeah, I mean, because I, I see, the reason I have that nightmare is because I see it in my own peers. I see it, um, I see it in my own peers and their inability to actually make any use of the freedom that they even have. Right? They don't make great acts of they don't commit to any great acts of freedom or decisions at all. I, I, I find a lot of my peers, um, I hate this phrase that they use, but it's um, keeping their options open, mm. right? And if your ideal of freedom is just keeping your options open, 
you actually don't exercise your freedom. Your freedom stays in a state of potency. It never gets reduced to act. And so they don't, you don't actually even use your freedom, whether to marry or to go into religious life or whatever it may be, but to, to really commit to something in an irrevocable way is a horror to my peers. So it's, that would not be it. <clears throat> that shows you that it's not a failure on my or my wife's part, although we could also fail catastrophically as well. But there is something in the way our culture forms people, not just our elites, but, but ordinary people as well, for whom it makes it very difficult to live lives of virtue and just ordinary decency. That goes to your point, Sarab, that um, there's, there's more than just what parents would do to, uh, to form the next generation, because as, as clearly right now, you see, it's, it's um, you know, these are good parents. Everyone wants best for their children, but somehow um, you have all these, even elites who are confused about what to do in life. Yeah, I, I've been doing a study on um, First Timothy, uh, First Timothy in general, but uh, the study that we did on Monday was on First Timothy six, uh, and there's a verse in there. I don't remember which one exactly it is, but it talks specifically about how uh, money is the root of all kinds of evil, and I was thinking about how in this town and also in New York City. Uh, Money in in that sense can be substituted for power, or uh, I think in some cases, which would probably make libertarians mad, uh, <laughs> freedom. Uh, people want to keep their options open so that you know they can provide for themselves. Uh, they they can make their own decisions and they want to be independent and not reliant on other people. Uh, I think that's that's one of the 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 failings of the modern West is that we don't teach uh, a life. Uh, we don't teach people to live a life full of content, contentedness and, and being happy with, with what you have and the sorts of opportunities you're presented with. So I know that's kind of a long lead in to, to my follow-up no, okay. question I've been here. Giving incredibly digressive answers. So <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would love to know what, what you think the, um, solution is here I, how can we create a culture and and if not a culture a community even in in a neighborhood um that honors that kind of mindset and raises children in a, in in an area that that puts them in a healthier mindset uh that is more uh not just honoring to god but also to to one's community and to one's family well i mean what you asked me is how do we <laughs> How do we remake America? Yeah, what is the bit, meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? How do you... Um, um, I mean, part of the attempt of this book is um, uh, to argue for, for a recovery of various traditions that we've foolishly discarded. When you make it put it sound like that, like how do we now create a culture that's this this way and that, it sounds very intimidating. But if you frame it as how do we recover certain traditions then it's not so daunting because uh, the whole point of traditions is that they are the accumulated wisdom of generations. And that, in a way, should put people at ease because it means that you don't have to reinvent the moral wheel. You don't have to reinvent what community means, what it means to be responsible, what it means to fulfill your obligations as a father or a wife or a husband or whatever, but that these are um, things that have been worked out in in some way. Circumstances change. You have to reason about them. But nevertheless, um, if tradition is ordered continuity, the sense that there's a kind of these steps leading behind you and then they lead forward as well, then you don't, you don't have to be thinking about how do we build a community from the abstract. Rather, the question becomes well, what are the traditions that we heedlessly discarded and how do we recover some of them? I'll just give one example, which I think is paradigmatic and, and can be helpful, is the, is the question of the Sabbath. So uh, Sabbatarianism is an American tradition that uh, predates the Republic. It existed in the... Sabbatarianism, by the way, is the idea that, that this the law should honor one day off for, for people to, to worship and, and be with family. It existed in in Puritan New England. And you think, okay, that's Puritan New England. 
but it also ex existed in colonial Virginia, which was supposedly the more, quote unquote, secular colony. And then in New Amsterdam, which became New York. So it, it, Americans were keeping the Sabbath before there was a kind of concept of an American republic. And it, um, it not only gave people this, um, obviously, a, a way to honor God in a concrete way where there's one day which you spend in worship, in in focusing on contemplative things, reading scripture, but it also was it was a give the working man a break, frankly, right? There's there's six days a week in which all of us have to kind of be acquisitive and relentlessly competitive, but there's one day when we just sort of cease in this relentless warfare, and the loss of it is a relatively recent thing. In other words, Americans think Sabbath laws. The last statewide blue law was abolished in 2019, and that was in North Dakota. So. Um, and it, there's it, there's not iron law that says that there's no recovering that. Um, you could imagine, for example, an alliance of religious conservatives and the labor movement restoring something like blue laws, because what we've actually found is that the loss of the Sabbath makes us miserable. You don't have any break. You, there's this kind of constant harried quality of the life. For people like in our social class, it just means that even on Sunday, if I'm eating dinner with family or whatever, there's that buzz of of my boss or whatever, someone on on Twitter that wants to contact me and I'm just kind of like, what what's going on? Like, and I can't quite focus on my family. That's horrendous. It's horrendous. Yeah, I used to, um, a long time ago, I used to work uh, in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, this was probably five years ago now yep. and the, uh, the big push I think it was the 20th time this bill had been offered was to uh, repeal the ban on Sunday liquor sales in Minnesota this was this was a big thing and it was pitting the big supermarket chains against the and I, the reason I bring this up is because you were talking about something similar on the clubhouse we did with you uh, earlier this week it pitted these these big grocery store chains against local liquor stores. The local liquor stores did not want to be open on Sunday. They wanted, you know, to have Sunday off. They didn't want to have any competition. And the big um, chains, the big box. Yep. Yep. The big chains wanted to be able to sell liquor and beer and all of that for uh, people who wanted to watch the Vikings game on Sunday. And at the time, as an avowed libertarian, I was like, man, who do these liquor store owners like think they are, you know, trying to like stop uh uh, you know the the free market from from operating, but I I definitely see it now. I mean, in my personal life, um, so I shut my phone off on Saturday. Uh, I I I don't do work on Saturday. I take Saturday as my yeah. as my Sabbath, and it is, by the way, quite frankly, the best day I have all week. Like I love you, and I love working <laughs> with you, but I can't the, get a hold of Nick on Saturday. But the, so well, you can always you can always like text or call EV if there's an emergency <laughs> like I know I'm, I'm I'm somewhat reachable but the the day a week I get away from you sometimes is my <laughs> is, is, is my best day of the week um so I I, I want to sorry I feel, I feel kind of bad for saying that out um so I want to drill down uh just a little bit more into your family in particular how are you raising your son yeah. and what's the incentive for people to still get married and have families in a godless society. Yeah, how am I raising my son is um, is a good question. Here's here's where I should start. When I was when I when 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 I learned that my wife um, was pregnant with our first child, I had this picture of a kind of ideal picture of what it would be like to raise a child. And it meant that there would be no toy, no plastic toys, only, you know, wooden Swedish toys. And, and uh, the child would just sit and, and, and I'll, I would read Homer, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to him. And, and he, he, you know, it's, it's not like that. It's, it's just unbelievably yeah. messy. You got set aside the kind of disorders and confusions of modern life, blah blah. blah. Just it, it's just a messy, difficult process because yeah. there are half-formed, unformed human beings that that need to be formed to become fully human, to become fully uh, 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 you know, wise adults. But they're well behind that, right? There's like years <laughs> to go until they get there, 
your and attempts so, to teach Portuguese to your two-year-old did not work. <laughs> exactly, 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 exactly. And so, um, you know, so I should start with just saying that it is, it's really difficult and there's, there's no way to get around it other than making the leap. You, you got to make the leap and what makes you want to make the leap or what makes the leap worthwhile is the fact that they're just wonderful. It's love. It's love. You, you, there's no other way to put it. Like the, my, my son's face, my, uh, my daughter's face, it just, they drive me as a man. And I, I, you know, I, I want to succeed. Can you remind us how, how old your kids are, by the way? Max know. is four. My daughter's, uh, her, her name is Serafina. She's a year and a half. Okay. So we're in the thick of it. Um, frankly, it's like right now I, I preach, you know, you have keep, to write a book to get out of the house right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's like, keep the Sabbath, da, 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 da. But like, you know, frankly, it's like my wife that's making it all possible, the fact that I'm, I'm joining you on that uh, right now. But um, I don't know where I'm going with this other than to say that it, it is absolutely worthwhile. Um, you know, if that's your state in life, you should do it. And and I don't understand guys who like date date the same woman for like 10 years on and off. Like, what are you? do it, you know, get married, have kids. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say to them, but it's so, it's so difficult with some of my friends who are like older guys. And it's just like, when, when, um, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's messy. And the stuff I write here is important. Ideas are really important, but really in the formative ages, as Aristotle says, it's, imitation it's it's what you do it's what you do they watch everything they imitate everything and that's a great responsibility it's a great responsibility so if you lose your temper easily you suddenly you have this other eye watching you this pair of eyes other than your own conscience that you're like Oof, that's not good they just saw me lose my temper if you um if you act impatient if you whatever whatever your vices might be beyond your own conscience there's this other pair of eyes of people who are watching it and who will be formed by how you act i don't know that sounds very stressful but it's also very joyful and what makes it joyful is love in a way that's very hard to put into words when it's it's a it's a massive responsibility but it's like one of those um i think responsibilities that makes or breaks you as as a man right like mm -hmm. whether you can provide that example for your child uh, I think that's important, and it's very clear that you that you take it seriously, which is why I wanted you to share yeah. your advice with our listeners. But I'm sorry, that wasn't really advice. Like I didn't, I don't know if I delivered advice. Yeah. Ta I was take just, your role seriously. Yeah, take and it gravely, seriously. So. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah. yeah. But it, other than it's, it's hard, but it's also infinitely worthwhile. Mm. I don't know what else to say. Children responding to the behaviors they see modeled around them is something that can be abstracted to beyond parents. It's the society they live in that is also instructive to a lesser degree, but but meaningfully so. What is it in the world around you that makes you most angry when it comes to the example that's being set for your children? Don't say drag queen Sawyer. Right <laughs> no, 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 no. um, I mean, honestly, right now it's... it's uh, which. Uh, is not at the kid at the school that my children attend, but it's very ever present in 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 New York City schools and in Washington. I'm sure is um, you know this race essentialism, critical race theory, um, the idea that my kids, <laughs> or again the background is so humorous in this in this context that I'm Iranian, my wife's Chinese, but in the intersectionality. Uh, kind of uh, hierarchy of sinfulness our our kids are marked as fairly sinful i guess when you're saying that's not a blessing of liberty <laughs> yeah <That's, laughs> i was i was reliably informed that was a blessing of liberty yes. yeah your children um, being taught to despise themselves as a yeah blessing no of I, don't, I don't i don't like it I, I mean um it's one thing to address obviously a history of racial just uh, injustice in this country and come to terms with it but um to to teach kids to it's not even by the way it's not just this racial guilt or whatever it's this i want my kids to go to school and learn um 
learn about you know the Napoleonic Wars and who who which powers were involved in Napoleonic Napoleonic Wars? How did they get sparked? How did they come to an end? Who was Napoleon? Who were the, who was the Tsar who opposed him? How did Tolstoy turn that into uh, the greatest novel of all time? That's the kind of thing I want my kids to learn. I mean, not at this age, but when they're the appropriate age, I don't want them to constantly meditate on themselves, right? Like I, I hear, I have friends in New York City where their kids learn about, um, they keep gender diaries, where they <laughs> every day they meditate several times a day about what they, where they feel on yeah. the gender spectrum. And it's just like, and they're paying 50K a year. Yeah. People will meme themselves into being transgender just to add some spice to the diary. Yeah, the diary's <laughs> gonna get boring after a while. I'm, mm, I'm still a still a straight man. So I, I still know. have very high testosterone today. <laughs> uh. I, but I, I kid you not, elite kids at, at a certain school in New York City keep gender diaries, and so it's like I don't want them to learn about themselves in that in that narrow solipsistic way. I want them to learn real things. That's what angers me right now. There's much more that could anger me that, uh, you know, a thousand things, but that's that's what I can pick on and grasp that right now. It's funny, the first time that people may interact with some of the great thinkers that uh, have informed the Western t- tradition over the last, uh, you know, 3,000 years may well be in reading your book, which is structured around sort of 12 different um, thought leaders across time uh, uh, coming from a variety of traditions, one of which is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, in one of your chapters, you you structure it around a speech he gave at Harvard uh, University back in, uh, I believe it was in the 1970s. 78. 1978. And uh, there's there's a paragraph here that I will, I'll read from again. You're, you're hawking a book right now. I, I think that this is helpful, but you know, it's uh, <laughs> please uh, re- read entire pages. He, he he saw a West captive to a tyrannical notion of rights. The defense of individual rights, he warned, had reached such extremes as to make society as a whole defenseless against certain individuals. Terrorism run rampant because there were lawyers and judges less committed to society as a whole than they were to maximizing the rights of defendants who, if they had their way, would destroy society and all rights. Oppressive regimes like the one that had thrown him into the gulag took advantage too, hiring lawyers, lobbyists, and other profiteering henchmen to advance their interests in the West legally. Uh, critical race theory, as uh, are many of the various pathologies that American society is beset with these days, are are often uh, couched in uh, a, a legalistic definition of of the good, which is purely procedural. Um, why is that not enough? Why did Solzhenitsyn think that that wasn't enough? Yeah. Um, so to give you the, just a little bit of the context, which I think um, your viewers might, listeners or viewers might find interesting. Um, so, you know, he had escaped from uh, the Soviet Union in 1974 He'd written the the expose of what was happening in the Gulag, the Gulag Archipelago, and a novel based on it as well. And um, he comes to America, and all sorts of universities want to give him honorary degrees and have him speak, but he refuses for the most part until Harvard comes. He accepts. And as he put it to his diary, he says, I was expected to sing the immigrant's ode to the great Atlantic fortress of liberty. Of course, that's not what he delivered infamously or famously, depending on how you look at it. He kind of the speech was an indictment of the West. And it wasn't like he was saying Soviet communism was better at all. I mean, he was just an inveterate opponent. He detested the Soviet regime and to the end of his days. And he came he lived long enough to see its dissolution. But he felt that something had also gone wrong in the in the free West. Um and it was this um, this failure to, as he put it, to distinguish between freedom for the good and freedom for evil. Just pure legalistic, um, let me get my own way with no regard for the common good. He, he felt that that also produced a kind of tyranny, but it was a more diffuse tyranny. It was private tyranny for the most part. Often it was done uh, not by a centralized government, but by, let's say, companies, corporations, media entities that all enforce the same kind of worldview. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think that um, you you read the speech. At the time, he was called a theocrat, an authoritarian, a kook, a mystic. But it's, Various nicknames you're quite familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is a reaction of liberal order to anyone who just like, uh, questions any uh, dimension of it. But um, 
it 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 now reads very much prophetically and um the fact that uh this liberal absolutism um makes it so hard to feed, for people to find a sense of communal good or the common good opens the way to hucksters who rep- who can offer kind of racialized versions of it like that could be uh, a white nationalist but it can also be ibrahim kindi right if there's no common good if there's no nothing that binds a community together no shared sense of justice then you'll get hucksters like kindi who can say um uh, who can divide who can create subgroups of solidarity um and and use ancient grievances or old grievances to pit people against each other in a profoundly destructive way. I think Solzhenitsyn predicted that. His criticism of the West uh, and specifically the United States uh, was one I think that's that's seeing a lot of renewed interest today. That that rights talk. Uh, Ryan Anderson, our, our uh, a previous guest on this podcast, called it called it that. R- rights talk is not enough. Uh, th- there have to be substantive goods that you're pursuing as a regime. Uh, this is an argument that you have made in recent years uh, to great um, scorn from the establishment right. Uh, it's, a, it's a debate that you had with, with someone named David French not too long ago. Um, what, what sort of made you uh, attuned to the, uh, to the, the lack of substance in, in the rights talk that animates the American right and what eventually resulted in, in that skirmish with French? I mean, just just reality, reality. I mean, I I always tell my friends who 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 are doctrinaire libertarians. I have a three word motto: Look around you. Enough enough libertarian theory. Just just look look at look at the degradation of the culture. Look at the opioid addiction. Look at the suicide. Um, you know, don't live in a fantastical um, ideal of what the American order was all about. Which, by the way, it was never as libertarian as libertarians imagine. The speech rights, the absolutist speech rights that they envision are really a kind of invention of the post-war courts. They're not. Otherwise, it would have been in, un, they would have been unthinkable even to the founders, right? I mean, especially to the founders. Um, but, and look around you. I mean, this is th- this was uh, the, my um, awakening is by beginning with reality. Um, and a certain frustration with with a, a certain type of conservative who, for example, only offers moral exhortation to the working class. Like, yeah, well, if only people got married, if only people, more people went to church. It's like, well, what are the material conditions that make it difficult for poor people to go to church? What are the material conditions that... Um, uh, 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 make it difficult for people to form families. What are the cultural expectations? What are the cultural expectations, so? and and what role does law have in promoting or undergirding those expectations? In all of those cases, you see that obviously law forms people, and there is no neutrality. There's it's one way or another, you're enshrining one vision of of what it means to be happy as a human being or another, and the one that we've enshrined is is perverse and wrong. The success sequence is something that a lot of uh, uh, establishment conservatives love to to parrot. You know, get married, um, and don't have children um, un- until you're married, and and finish high school. I believe is is traditionally how it goes, or get as much education as you can. Forget the fact that education is anything but these days. Uh, but I, I always am frustrated because that seems to be the end point of a process that currently includes to call back to something you highlight in your book. Uh, a reality where there is no Sabbath day. You must work 18 hours a day in order to survive, especially at the lower ends of the income scale. And every cultural artifact that is promoted by liberal order tells you that actually you'd be much happier if you were sleeping around, never having children, never getting married. Uh, and you know drugs are probably okay too. But we're going to wag our finger at you when you don't get married or, or don't get as much education or do as drugs, you can or do drugs. Yeah. Um, it seems fundamentally unsatisfying. You had a piece in, in Spectator magazine not too long ago where you talked about conservatives who get it and ones who don't. What to you defines a conservative who gets it? 
there are many factors. I mean, I, I, I wrote that piece last summer, so um, hard to, I have to jog my memory a little bit. But if I were to, to, to narrow it down, conservatives who get it pay attention to the material and class substrate that defines whether or not people are able to live decent, virtuous lives. Preaching virtue matters. But the law has to be supportive. I mean, this is this is Aristotle Book Nine. This is Thomas Aquinas's uh, treatise on law. That it's not enough for quote unquote civil society to to just issue exhortations to virtue, but rather the law has to make it. It has to incentivize lives of virtue, uh, and only the law can do that through punishment and incentive. Um, and 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 disincentivize dissolute lives. This is, I mean, I I have so many conversations with libertarian Christians, who are like, no, no but the, the, if you don't if you don't choose Christ freely, one hundred percent freely, then your your faith isn't deep enough. And you're if you don't live a life of virtue over against all this gauntlet that we've set up that you have to go through of pornography, and eighteen hour work days, and and jobs without any security. If you can't go through that, my friend. And then still retain your faith. Is your faith real? That's that's a kind of uh, Pelagianism, yeah. right? It's, it it's fetishizes like, persecution. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yes, you should stand strong in the face of persecution, but it doesn't mean we make it an end in and of itself, or or make it a good order society around. <laughs> like, oh, we get, we're going to make the most horrible society imaginable, and the ones who can manage to get through it and live virtuously and have kids, those, you know, that those <laughs> that's not how historic Christianity ever, not neither the. Catholic tradition, but not also confessional historic Protestantism, never thought about that that way. Of course, you try to structure uh, law in a way to to uh, to help people live virtuously, go to church, blah blah blah. I mean, it's just so obvious to me. But so, speaking of politics and Christianity, yeah. um, I've been really excited to have you on the show for a long time. We've been talking about it over Twitter DM for a couple months because uh, one of my first introductions to this kind of politics was watching your uh, debate with David French. My best friend from college, uh, Hunter, sent me the link. Uh, I believe I was sitting in a parking lot after a uh, after a haircut at Great Clips, and I and I sat in the car and watched this. I don't think I watched all of it in one sitting, but I watched you know a, a large portion of your of your debate with David French, and I was like, man, I gotta I gotta follow this guy, Saurabh Amari. <laughs> he seems like he's going places. He really knows his stuff. Um, so. The interesting thing about your debate with David is that uh, I found myself primarily agreeing uh, with you, sure. uh, a, a Catholic, not to use it in like a like an insulting way, like, oh, no, I agree with the Catholics. But um, I asked you about this uh, a couple days ago and you had a really good answer. Uh, I just want to ask what what is the. Um, what is the relationship that that Protestants and Catholics have uh, in this brand of of conservatism? How do we how do we work together? Where do our paths diverge? Uh, to you, what's I know we have a lot of Protestant listeners as well, and I don't yeah. I don't want all of these politics to be super inaccessible because it for you you know it comes from a very Catholic mindset. Mm -hmm. What what are what are the relationships between? you know, Catholicism and, and Protestantism in this kind of politics. So the way I would put it is the way I put it at, at on, on the Clubhouse event, which is that on on any given issue that's going to come up in the next two, three decades, you and I will agree and we'll work together because we have shared interests and, and you know, we're, we're uh, uh, we both proclaim Jesus Christ. And so um, there's a lot that we can work with on but i think as a matter of political imagination you know i'm not prepared to give up what i consider the perennial um kind of historic tradition of christianity of, of political thought in christianity which is that that the church and the faith become more fully themselves when they encompass civilization in other words and this is not necessarily i think um, entirely alien to Protestants. Certainly the kind of confessional Protestants built kind of <laughs> integralist mm -hmm. city-states for themselves in Geneva and elsewhere. So it's not entirely, um, it's just a matter of which authority they take seriously. 
but there is this one institution that's lasted two millennia and if you're grasping for certainty in this age authority absolutes continuity there's none other for me um than the roman church and that's a i use that term advisedly because um uh you know i my brand of what it means to be a political catholic um traces its roots actually to a a figure named jean danielou who's a who was a um Jesuit, a French Jesuit cardinal in the 1960s, and he was an expert at the Second Vatican Council, a, theolo- a theological expert at the, at, a, at the Second Vatican Council, and he just argued in a way that I think you would you would agree with me on this, that Christianity became more fully itself after the Constantinian conversion. That is, and we were just talking about this as well, that um, you know before the Constantinian conversion. In order for you to live a fully Christian life, you have to be a true ascetic. You had to be a a kind of spiritual elite able to withstand horrific persecution. And our Lord addressed himself to such people, but he also addressed himself to the masses all the time at the at the uh, 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 feeding of the five thousand, the the wedding at Cana, and all these things. We see you see him dealing with the masses. And so after the Constantinian conversion, when the, the faith becomes first the legal religion and ultimately the official religion of the Roman Empire, the ordinary Roman person can become a Christian in a kind of an easier way. And the population, the Christian share of the population massively expands within three generations after that. And um, uh, so what does that mean? Does that mean that every Roman citizen was deeply aware of every sentence in the creed of what it all meant and uh, there were no kind of just conversions that were just politic conversions where they've just some new order had come and they just changed their religion no it was precisely that for a lot of those people um, it was a new ritual that they picked up nevertheless they now benefited from these efficacious sacraments they have a more moral order that doesn't involve uh, i don't know abandoning children outside city walls to if they're unwanted children so on and so forth um and you had the birth of christendom so what is, what does that all that mean it just means that uh, christianity became a mass religion and it was made possible to think of something as christian peoplehood and the church came to encompass civilization a civilization, an important civilization, and that to strive for that in the 21st century is not a crazy thing to do. Do we? Does it? Does that mean in the 21st century resurrecting the exact forms of the Roman Empire? Of course not. Does it mean pining for a new Constantine? Not necessarily. But it does mean that the ultimate vision of a Catholic should be the intertwining of church and civilization. Um, there, I think you and I would necess- well, not necessarily agree at some point. Yeah. At some point, because then it becomes which authority, which Christian authority. Right. But in the meanwhile, we have much to work with on together. And and so this the sort of vision I'm, that I'm laying out is, is, is as a centuries-long vision, a millennial vision. Maybe I won't live to see any of it come to fruition. Mm-hmm. And in the meanwhile, you and I work together as as brothers in Christ. Yeah, I would like to add the the caveat to our listeners that Saurabh and I agree on probably like, I would say 99% of it. Like it's pretty cool. Yeah, almost if you go down everything. the issues, I, I yeah. can't even imagine. We, we agree. I don't on, even know what the 1% would be. Yeah, it's it, we agree on almost everything. Uh, and listen, I would rather live in a benevolent Catholic authoritarian society than whatever liberal order we have. Dystopia. Right now. Like, yeah, have it's like it's, it's and terrible. I've said this multiple times that I will take Protestant integralism, which we had a kind of Protestant pseudo integralism. It was never a fully establishment, but it was a semi establishment. Yeah. I would take that any time as a Catholic over over the liberal dystopia. Yeah. There is an organization <laughs> that you're about to speak uh, at a conference for called Pro Civitatis Dei. Um, and I think the title of it is, uh, it doesn't have to be this way. 
it reminds me of a conversation I had with a friend of mine, a young father of, of three, I think, um, probably more kids on the way. They, they're they're pretty efficient. Um, Can we get a name check? No, absolutely not. Okay. Um, him and I were having a conversation. His kids are, are starting to be public school age and uh, doesn't make a lot of money. He's in public service. And so he's probably going to have to either uh, stop having as many children or start sending them to private school. And public him, school. Yeah. Or sorry, to public school. Um, and him and I just engaged in a thought experiment. Um, what if it didn't have to be this way? What if he didn't have to spend every day dreading the day that'll come when he has to send his children into the belly of the beast to be indoctrinated by civilizational arsonists who want to destroy every element of the upbringing that he is trying to raise his children with, um, whether it is uh, their adherence to a sacramental faith whether, whether it is a fundamental self-confidence in themselves as people, whether it is a reflexive traditionalism when it comes to social mores, or whether it's any level of mannerisms or behavior or, or decency that he is trying to inculcate in his kids. What if he didn't have to spend every day wondering if the second his children leave the four cornerstones of his house, if they won't be beset by violence, by liberal order? at every direction and that's that's what i want that's for the, americans that's the, my look around you point so i i will try to put your two points together i don't deny that that there's a kind of um genial intelligence to david french and and there is admirable that he can he can show up at a a, a, a debate like that where it's designed to kind of bait him and he he answers everything mm -hmm. as best he can on the other hand yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, w what he's doing is providing, I think, s just sort of uh, a kind of sophistry in defense of what is un indefensible. What it, it's in, uh, it's indefensible in the light of the gospel. It's indefensible in, in the light of natural reason, and he he knows that. I think I think he knows that. So he has. I mean, that's why so many of t his tweets mm -hmm. get ratioed, where it's mm -hmm. like he'll come up with something, and it's like. It's something outrageous the left has done and he'll just say you know is crt really that bad and should christians be it's like yes it is bad it's really bad well and that's the other side of things too is that sometimes he'll <laughs> he'll say something like okay this this is really bad and i almost want to scream if only there was something we could do about that <laughs> yeah or we or, or if only you noticed a year ago. Yeah. Or if only we or had left some ago. play in the joints such that it didn't get to be so, so bad that finally you raise your hand and say no. Um, and, th and that's my fundamental critique is that elites on the right have a moral responsibility to protect the people they claim to represent and defend the interests of from the regime we live in. This is not decent. What... Uh, you know, American children are subject to in public schools. Drag queen story hour is not decent. And uh, critical race theory is not decent. A, a good deal of the things that we teach American children are not decent. And frankly, I think that our people, you know, people who, who are people of, uh, of faith, people who uh, uh, attest to certain moral truths, time-tested moral truths, deserve better than an elite class that simply says, well, what I will guarantee you till my dying day is the right to spend a million dollars in legal fees, taking your case all the way up to the Supreme Court to ensure that the constellation of religious liberty organizations that we have on the right to protect your interests stay well-funded. That's all we can offer you. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that's good enough. And a record that only renders unto uh, the vast majority of decent right-thinking people in this country the legal right to uh, stake out a claim in court to protect their right to raise their children in, again, a decent way. I, I, I don't think that that is a metric And the other thing that he failed to, to answer in the debate and still has failed to answer is the fact that so much of... Um, some of the so much of the censorship that our people face, the conservatives face, will never get to the court because it's all done by private entities. But it is censorship, and if 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 real freedom of speech that we would value survives or not, it'll happen on these big tech platforms. 
And frankly, I mean, he's been an absolute apologist for them. So, again, to go back to your earlier question, I, the, the tying it too much to Trumpism or not Trumpism, I think, was was the one thing I would do otherwise. But in terms of the critique, I mean, I, I, I do think, I mean, there's lots of people constantly, any given day, if you search the name, it'll be like Amari was right and every day. And um, may it continue to be so. May it continue to be so. And I, <laughs> I hope not. I stand I because stand Amari it. being right means things are getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, and and look, I mean, I, I've always had a very qualified defense of David French. Like, uh, you know, his his uh, action campus free speech litigation made it so that I was able to, as a college student, speak more freely. Entirely fair. Uh, but I, I think that him as synecdoche for the uh, errors of the establishment right over the last 60 years is valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and he seems to enjoy being that synecdoche. So we'll continue using them as a stand in. Um, I, I want to ask you a positive question. Um, in 50 years, if every battle that you are staking in the culture, uh, in governance, in, in politics, goes your way what is the good and just society look like um what 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 would be um the environment in which the common good could flourish mm -hmm. that you see the empire of our lady of Guadalupe. <laughs> <laughs> more Big, specifically stretching, stretching, <laughs> stretching uh, from you know canada down to yeah. no no um that, that doesn't seem realistic um I think it's a place where, oh man, it sounds so. Just a, 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 a all it is is a demand for for normality. It's a demand for normality, where it's clear in the culture that men and women are complementary but different, and their differences are um, uh, are immutable and unbridgeable. At, at the kind of biological level, which is not just the teaching of, of Genesis, but the cheating, the teaching of, of genetics. Um, if I can get that, that'll be enough. Then everything else might go wrong, but the, but the idea that we've, we've stuck to the reality of embodied, of gender as an embodied reality, that's so important to me. It, because everything else would flow from it. It means that we have a civilization that's sane. A civilization that says men and women are um, are just social contract that's are, are social contracts, and not only are they social contracts constructs, but at the same time, some people can be born with an innate sense of gender that clashes with the bodily one they inherited from nature. That just means reality is is out of the picture. So, what we stand for is ultimately, I think, is not the position of the Catholic Church with respect to the state, blah, 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 all that. It's, is, is reality vindicated or not? Is society... I, I see us going in a kind of... You, you know the movie Blade Runner 2049? Yeah. It, it feels like we're heading there, like in a, in a, instead of in, a, in an inexorable way. And if we can avoid that, if we can avoid this um, kind of Gnostic civilization of uh, of of the the sheer will ruling over reality and overturning reality if we can have avoided that i'll have won and even in, and, and and no area is it clearer than this question of the reality of 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 sex as a biological reality it can seem small ball um but upon closer examination if you believe as we do that the family is the immutable uh indivisible unit of a functioning civilization man and woman in their respective domains at the head of it um understanding properly what those respective domains are make it flourish from there all the other small ball policies can emerge mm -hmm. but if you don't get the question of man as man woman as woman correct then you don't have any civilization to speak and, and of. the child is the icon of their love right as the image of their love yeah right yeah. the book is the unbroken thread discovering the wisdom of tradition in an age of chaos go buy it uh and Saurabh, thank you for coming on the show thanks guys
The unbroken thread is a call to tradition, properly understood. Uh, it draws on all sorts of different thinkers from across time, across different faith traditions, some basically secular themselves. But we also wanted to talk a little bit today about how tradition alone can't save us. We can't purely draw upon the old in order to advance what is good. Uh, there's a piece we wanted to talk about that we feature on AmCanon today called We Must Found Institutions, Not Just Preserve Them, A Conservatism of Creation. This was written by Andy Smerick at Public Discourse, a publication that our previous guest, Ryan Anderson, helped found. Uh, Andy and us probably disagree on a whole bunch of different issues about what the future of conservatism should hold. But on this, I think we are aligned. Um, I've, I've said in meetings before, I don't think I've ever said it publicly, that in order, our posture at American Moment is to build what we need, reform what we can, and destroy what we must. Uh, and it can sound pretty grandiose, especially that last bit, destroy what we must. Well, who are you to destroy? And that's precisely the approach that I have, is that anyone who talks excessively about uh, destroying institutions they disagree with or that they think are not fit to purpose probably doesn't have an ability to do so much themselves. And so we try not to focus on that too much. We try to lead by example by building an institution at American Moment that we believe in that is fit to the task of restoring the American right and making it a force to be reckoned with uh, in the West again. Um, and then, you know, reforming institutions that are capable of doing so. It's a posture that I, I think is incredibly important. And I know that Nick believes in a lot. I mean, he's he has been building things for years at this point. Nick, w why did you think that this piece was important to talk about? Yeah, I think this is there are two reasons why uh, this this issue in particular is kind of complex in Washington. You know, that the first is that when coming from um you know, either the the new right or I don't know if you really call it like the new left, but like the progressive left. Um, there's this there's this kind of mentality of like returning to this tradition of uh, what true, you know, progressivism or conservatism is. Um, and I think a lot of people just want to rely on that tradition as opposed to, you know, building something that will implement it. Uh, so that's one part to it. The other part is this is the laziest town I've ever been to in my entire <laughs> life. Like, listen, I can leave the office at 5, 5.30, 6, not an inch of traffic on, yeah. on the road to Virginia. Yeah. People have been drinking since 4. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and on the times when I've, like, needed to go to Virginia for a meeting, like, I have found that peak rush hour in D.C., 3.30 p.m. Like, that... That is the time when people are going home. Uh, this is also the town notorious for a two and a half day work week. Um, so I think the problem that we face in Washington and why we kind of have this policy and like institution building decay over the last couple of decades is just because there, there a lot of people want to assume that there are no new ideas, that there are no new institutions to be built. No, no, no. We have a couple hundred years of history. We're, we're done. We're done building new stuff. Um, and then the other fact is that people are lazy. Uh, and so kind of how American Moment came to be is Sarab had this crazy idea and texted me at 3.30 in the morning while I was sleeping um, <laughs> and said, hey, I have this crazy idea. We should we should talk and myself and, you know, Jake uh, Mercier, our, our, our co-founder. And we chatted the next day. And as soon as we, you know, heard of the idea for American Moment, we we felt a moral obligation to uh, follow through on this idea that Sarab had, had uh, and to build something bigger than ourselves. Uh, and I think that that's, that's important. Uh, it's not frequently that people have such a, uh, such a uh, you know, divine call, I guess, placed on their life. Uh, and I think that you have a moral obligation to do those things, to, to, to build things um, instead of just relying on tradition or of... Uh, you know, the ideas uh, or writings of, of someone else. Those things are important too, obviously, but I think it's important to have both. If you want to build something, do it. 
uh, that's the only advice that we can give. Uh, it was a long, long, long year, basically, of very hard work before we launched, but it was worth it. And and I think that the the posture that that Smerik lays out in his piece, I think, is exactly correct. We have a lot of different allies, you know, whether it's Russ Vogt at the Center for Renewing America or in CAS at American Compass or others that are in the process of or have built new institutions that are tackling new problems. Well, and can I, sorry, I thought of something else. Yeah. I want to give one more piece of advice. If you're going to build something or if you're going to do something, the best way to move forward on it is to work on it and not tell anyone about it. <laughs> so we worked, I, I tell people all the time when I when I go into these meetings, whether it's with new vendors or when we're doing fellowship interviews or when we're doing uh, you know interviews for our first employee, I say that American moment is like an iceberg. Everything that you guys see right now, what's on the website, What's um, you know on Amcanon, what's on social media, this podcast, that is the very tip of the iceberg. Uh, we spent basically a year working without pay and all the free hours that we had to build something without telling anyone. Um, you want true dedicate, like not to toot our own horn, but you want true dedication to cause. It's it's doing it and building something while no one is watching. Yeah. It's not a perfect correlation, but the things that are most worth doing are the ones that are going to get you the least public praise. Mm. Um, so that's the posture we recommend that our followers uh, and listeners adopt. Um, and it's it's one that we exist as a resource to help foster. Um, thank you guys for listening. We're still blown away every week when we do this podcast and we realize that way more of you are listening than we ever thought. Nick and I have been recognized in Washington, D.C. by strangers. This is very disturbing to us. We don't like it. Someone uh, asked me for an autograph the other day, and I was like, no, <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah, please, please do not give either myself or Nick the ego, um, but feel free to say hello if you do see us. If I'm eating, forgive me if I look like I short circuit. But anyway, please make sure to rate the podcast five stars, uh, ask questions, and we'll be sure to see you next week with another episode of Moment of Truth. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.